here with Jackie Lukeman. What's up? And we are your number one source for struggle, socialism, and soul. Mm -hmm. And today is Friday, April 12th, 2024. Uh, Jackie, how you feeling? I'm feeling very relaxed today for some odd reason. I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I'm just going to take it, be happy that I'm relaxed and, and just be glad that I felt relaxed. And I actually noticed it this time, <laughs> but I'm doing pretty good. You looking all right, brother? How you feeling? Hey man, everything's cool. You know, just, just, just maintaining, you know, taking it one day at a time. Uh, you were just telling me off air that uh, you got a, a new edition coming. Yes. I know people are like, oh my God, pregnant. No, that's, that's not. Oh wait, hard. no, I didn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't mean to make it sound like that. No, no. <laughs> yeah, that's that's never happening. And if it does, yeah, that would be a miracle. The second one. So, but no, I um, I've been a, I've been a, I've had pets all my life. Uh, so I'm used to having, uh, cats or dogs. And and I had cats until I was until I found out I'm allergic to cats. Um, so I can't ever have cats because the allergy is really bad. But I love dogs. And uh, for people who don't know, Abdus and I, our little uh, our little fur baby, Brewski, who was a 90 pound, pretty much 11 year old dog when he passed in 2022. Um, he was the last of, of the little Lukeman family uh, who that, you know, after Abdus left, he he couldn't stay long either. He had to go with his pop. And that's 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 fine. They're together. But me, I was a little lonely. So I had to wait. I had to get approval from the doctors at the uh, Kidney Transplant uh, Institute at Georgetown University Hospital. And they made a deal with me that because they told me I cannot travel until like June, that I could have a dog now. So I'm like, fine, because I was unhappy about both. Wait, I can't have a dog and I can't travel? Can't Come travel. on. So they're like, F fine, fine. You can have the dog now. So... I went to look at a dog and tomorrow I'm going to pick up, uh, his name is Sirius now, but he will be called Kimathi Abdus Lukman, the gorgeous seven-year-old Roddy Lab Mix gentleman. Nice, nice. Well, that, 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 that's a great name too. Um, well, you know, Jackie, I think the main thing that's, uh, one of the main things that's been sort of high up in the news here lately is the fact that uh, OJ is dead. And uh, for all my Southern rap fans, no, I'm not talking about uh, OJ the Juice Man of Atlanta. I'm happy to report he's still very much with us. Whew, thank um, God. <laughs> yeah, you know. And, you know, it's funny, you laugh, but that, that was a real conversation I had with a friend of mine. I said, you know, OJ died. He was like, did he get shot? I was like, no. Listen. <laughs> and he's like, oh. <laughs> oh, that OJ. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Owen Paul James Simpson uh, has died at 76 years old, reportedly of uh, prostate cancer. Uh, obviously, a uh, football star, actor, and um, someone who was accused of brutally murdering two people some time ago um, that he uh, basically got off for, I think, both thanks to the skill of Johnny Cochran and some serious mistakes <laughs> made by the other side. And you know, the O.J. Simpson trial is such a, it, it was such a, I don't know, an impactful moment in American culture because no one ever forgot about it. Like the, the O.J. continued to be like a cultural reference point long after the trial itself had concluded. And, you know, I was like seven or eight when this was happening. So I was aware of it, but of course, I didn't understand <clears throat> the weight of it until much later. But it really is a quite complicated thing. Now, a lot of things people say are complicated are actually complicated. <laughs> right. They're like, just lazy. Like, they just don't want yeah, to. Like, like, like Israel's war on Gaza is not complicated. Right? No. But when we talk about the O.J. Simpson trial, we're talking about issues of race, issues of class, issues of fame, uh, all these sorts of things that, that were swirling around that led to the uh, uh, sort of ultimate result. But I'm curious, Jackie, you know, as someone who would have been more aware of what was happening at the time, 
I mean, what do you remember like about that period and what it was like when those things were um, unfolding and the fact that the response to the verdict was very clearly uh, uh, made along racial lines? Yeah, I, I I too cannot remember that trial, can't cannot forget that trial, but but not like for the reasons most people remember it, right? Because most people remember obviously uh um at the beginning of the uh, trial when the prosecution uh what was it, Marsha Clark and Chris Darden, who I'm sorry, if anybody really watched that trial closely early day, like I did. There was no way you did not know that there was something going on between those two. And part of watching the trial was just like, those two? Really? Huh. Um, but, you know, at the beginning of the trial, Sean, I remember thinking, well, he had this coming. <laughs> I mean, O.J. Simpson has never been, and for people who are not old enough to remember O.J. Simpson when he was playing and he was doing movies, um, O.J. Simpson has never been a fan of Black people. Um, he has never identified himself with uh, Black people. He specifically said that he did not like Black women. I wonder how his mama felt about that. But I mean, that's what it was. So so I remember like the first few days or weeks of the trial, people in my neighborhood, Black people were like, man, they got him. They got him dead to rights. And, and even though nobody wanted to see another Black man go down for a murder of white people, it's like, man, if you were that sloppy, as they are saying you were, I mean, I don't know what you want us, but, but, but Johnny Cochran's defense and and I said this to before to people, and it, it wasn't received well, so it's probably not going to be received well now. But Johnny Cochran's defense was not brilliant as much as it was what you said, Sean, serious mistakes by the prosecution. And it was those mistakes by the prosecution specifically putting Mark Furman on the stand. That's what I remember the most about that trial, that I, I was like, I had no sympathy whatsoever for, for OJ Simpson leading up to Mark Furman's testimony. And, it, and it's at that moment that even Black people who understood that OJ Simpson was not our friend, um, he, he hated us. He, he didn't want to have anything to do with us. So we... Black people weren't like in love with O.J. Simpson, but they saw once Mark Furman took the stand, I think, then it became a situation of, oh, this is another instance of the system trying to destroy a black man. Right. All because Mark Furman got on the stand and somehow thought that nobody was going to find out that he was a raging racist while he was a detective in the LAPD. And that might have impacted some of the things he did wrong uh, when processing evidence and that kind of thing. So I think, I really feel like people, Black people weren't watching the trial and, and were like, oh, I hope OJ Simpson gets off because nobody really cared about OJ Simpson that much, you know, as, a, as like a cultural kind of figure for us. But the the cultural acknowledgement of that trial was having a cop, a white cop who is a racist and a documented racist um, involved in any way with collecting evidence in this trial against O.J. Simpson. That's what people were like, oh, no, this 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 dude can't win. You know, it's like they cannot be allowed to win with this dude as a part of the evidence. So I really believe that the, the, the jubilation at the reading of the verdict was not so much because black people were like, yay, our man's OJ Simpson is getting off because OJ Simpson was not any black person's man's. <laughs> he was not. And, and we all knew that. I think a lot of black people saw that for once, one time, a black person was able to defeat very well established and usually very successful um, white supremacist law enforcement 
and legal system in this country. So it, it, it wasn't a celebration of, of OJ being free or found not guilty. For a lot of black people, a lot of folks I talked to, like, were you celebrating for OJ? And they were all like, nah, certain expletive that dude. <laughs> no, it's about this one time we beat the system. Right. And and it's I can't explain it better than that. But I, I think that if you talk to people my age and, and older who watched that trial, I think you will hear the same thing, that there was no sympathy for O.J. Simpson. But there was a feeling that O.J. Simpson was able to defeat this system. And I don't think people were even saying so much that O.J. Simpson was able to, de to defeat the system. They were giving the credit to Johnny Cochran, which they should have, you know, but. But it, it, it was not that the, the celebration was not for O.J. Simpson because he was and still is a despicable human being. Um, but people, black people were celebrating the fact that this time the system didn't win. And that's unfortunate because he did it. Yeah, come on. We all know he did. <laughs> and, and, and if you look at the totality of the evidence they had against them, the fact that the prosecution put on some really crummy witnesses and were really sloppy with the evidence. Um, Cato Kalin? I mean, seriously? Whose idea was it to put that? Do, do you see what I mean? So, so it was like the prosecution had a slam dunk, runaway, no questions asked case. And they screwed it up because they put these weirdo white people <laughs> on the stand who really, I think, made people question, like, what? how far are they trying to go to convict this dude? Why don't they just present the evidence? These people are a mess. Um, and, and I think O.J. Simpson proved that he is a, desp a despicable human being after the trial with all of the things he did after that. And and nobody I know has ever like doubted or were surprised by his antics after the trial because we all knew he was despicable. Um, but it, it's, you know, this is just one of those stories, Sean, that I, where else could it happen but here? <laughs> right? It's like, I, I know there are a bunch of weird celebrity focused you know, murder trials and scandals in other countries, but this kind of thing, I I can't, I don't know. I, I just think this, I think this country is such a cartoon character of democracy that, that this kind of weirdness can't happen anywhere but this place. But I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, you know, I tend to think that maybe the prosecution got too cocky. I think they looked at it and said, oh, this is an open and shut case, mm -hmm. which was true, but you still got to open and shut it. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? And, and they didn't do that. And, and no. it's like you say, you put you put Mark Furman up there who, when asked if he planted evidence, he pled the fifth. <laughs> like, you know, it's and, and you yes talk, or no question. You're, you're, you're talking about, you know, and you mentioned the evidence, you know, the, the mishandling of things. They riding around with blood samples in the hot trunk, sticking it in the garage on top of the lawnmower. Like, dog, did y'all want to win this case? You know, and, and, and when you were talking about the response to the verdict, it, it reminded me of that joke from uh, from Chris Rock when he said after the verdict, black people was like, we won, we won. Like, what the F did we win? Right. Right. Like when I checked the mailbox, I didn't see my OJ prize. And <laughs> exactly. I'm st still waiting for my George Soros check. Still waiting right. for, for my Putin check. Still waiting for that OJ check. That OJ prize. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I ain't seen it yet. And that guy was just unhinged. Like, I, I would just before we got on air today, I looked up. I don't know if people remember that OJ wrote a book. <laughs> and and Jackie's laughing because she knows where I'm going. And some of you <laughs> listening do too. OJ Simpson wrote a book where he hypothetically confessed to murdering his wife and Ron Goldman and called the book If I Did It. <laughs> And the original publisher 
canceled the book because mm -hmm. there was outcry because people said, well, he shouldn't profit from his crime. But then uh, the Goldman family got the rights to the book, <laughs> republished it with essays from members of the family. And it, it, that is, and again, it's it, it's a bizarre thing that came out of another bizarre thing that could have only happened in the United States. And Jackie, I don't know if you remember this interview that OJ did a little while after um, the trial. It was just like this news, you know, special basically, where this uh, woman, I forget her name, white, uh, white redheaded woman, was interviewing OJ. And the one part I remember out of few, they were like at a festival or a fair or something. And this white woman comes up to OJ and she shakes his hand like she wants to meet him. And she goes, and she says something like, always wanted to meet a murderer. And, and he just goes, oh, okay. <laughs> and the reporter's like, what do you make of that? And he's like, oh, what are you going to do? And the, the last thing that they show is she's like in a room, her and the camera crew, there's a knock at the door. They open the door. It's OJ with a fake knife. Oh my God. Literally going, hing, 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 hing. And I'm like, dog. <laughs> if you, if you, even if you, if you really didn't do it, why would you, why would you joke like that? Like two people were still like brutally murdered. Right. And you're like right. joking, like, LOL, wasn't me. Like, and you know, and see a lot of this, a, a lot of things that all of that and more came out in that, uh, I think it was a five part documentary series that um, CNN did, or was it ESPN on uh, OJ Simpson, which was excellent. And, and I strongly uh, encourage people to go watch it. But see, since I wasn't around really for OJ's career, um, I didn't realize that he didn't care for black people. I just looked it up. It is ESPN. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that he like hated black people. <laughs> and, you know, and also they told the story about he like stole his friend's girlfriend when when he was still black. So uh, OJ been a mess. But mm -hmm. what's so wild about that? <laughs> is that? He had all of that contempt for black people. But when he want when he you know, got off from that murder, who did he, he run to? <laughs> he ran to us. Uh -huh. So after the trial, oh, he's in black churches in the pulpit, putting on koofies and kente cloth stoles. He's hanging out with Steve Coakley. And that's that's black, Jack. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> it's so I dog, no, it, it, it really <laughs> is incredible how OJ had this black rebrand because he had nowhere else to go. Exactly. And one of the other things I remember from the ESPN documentary was they interviewed one of the jurors who was a black woman who literally said that they let OJ off basically as get back, you know, like for Rodney King <laughs> and every other racist thing that LAPD has done, yeah. of which there is a lot. And it was so funny because they were talking about this in the context of um, uh, OJ going to jail from that whole thing about him, like stealing back some of his own memorabilia or yeah, something like that. Yeah. Like him and the group of friends, it, another strange thing that, that OJ was involved in. And she was basically like, how could you mess this up? <laughs> like we, we, we gave you a layup. Right. And, and you, you know, you, you dropped the ball, but you know, one does get the feeling that that was kind of a second crack at OJ from uh, the, you know, the, the U.S. court system. Oh, yeah. And but in my opinion, that same racist U.S. court system only has itself to blame for that. <laughs> what? Right? Yeah. Because we're talking about, I mean, literally, not just. <laughs> Los Angeles, when we talk about the United States of America, we're talking about centuries of incessant racism, right? That has imbued every square inch 
of American society, including the criminal legal system, the police, the courts, the jails, the prisons, all of that. And then within the context of this other racist terror that had been happening in L.A. specifically, um, I mean, you know, not just like in, in 1992, but like we could go back to the Watts riots and, yeah, and yeah. all of that, a long history of racist terror in Los Angeles and the surrounding areas. All of that was bound up in this as well. And, you know, it, it, it's just a strange thing how, how things break down because, you know, even, I don't know if you're aware of this, Jackie, but I mean, OJ was still like active doing media. There's a sports podcast that people may be aware of that's hosted by uh, New York rappers Cameron and Mace. Mm -hmm. And they had OJ on fairly regularly. Yeah. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. And so I don't know, to, to quote another <laughs> not so great person, Don King, only in America. <laughs> exactly. It it does it never made sense to me. Um and, and, and they're 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 the black folks I can't I can't explain the, like the people who wanted to hang out with oj simpson after he was acquitted it's like okay it's one thing to cheer that somebody black got you know got over on the system okay but it's another thing to want to hang out with the the double murderer and 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 the cocky just despicable human so i you know look i cannot explain those black people who were like yay oj and i lost a whole lot of respect for for Mace and I didn't have a lot of respect for Cameron in the first place. Just not a fan. But 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 you know I was like I saw him there with Mace and I'm like where is the Christ in you? What happened to it? You know. Um and and, and it's just some people wanted to I think to get next to some celebrity even no matter how salacious the celebrity is. You know and I I just. I can't call that one, but I know most folks were like, yeah, he dirty, he shady, he ain't, you know, so-and-so, but <laughs> he got over on that racist though. <laughs> and it's just, you know, he, he will, it is, it is sad that <clears throat> he will always be remembered for murdering his wife and, uh, uh, this other person, um, and he won't be remembered for what he was actually really great at, which was his football career. He was amazing. O.J. Simpson was celebrated in football for a reason. He was he was great on the field. His acting was, you know, in a bunch of campy movies. But you know, look, he was a he was a black man on um, top tier Hollywood comedy movies. That that didn't happen very much outside of like Richard Pryor and the movies he did with, with Gene Wilder and, and Sidney Poitier maybe a little earlier with the, with um, uh, uh, Richard Pryor and, and, and the Uptown Saturday Night series. You didn't see a lot of black actors other than them pretty much in big comedy movies. And so OJ Simpson was that in the Airplane series, you know, people haven't watched, like I think it's the first two movies he's in. I mean, it would have been great if he had been remembered for that. But unfortunately, on the occasion of this man's death, we are reminiscing on uh, his infamy because this infamy is horrible. It's it's not, if it was just that he stole back his own memorabilia, I'd be like, okay, stop talking about that. That's ridiculous. No, he killed two people. And I don't care what anybody says. He did it. <laughs> and And it's just... <clears throat> It's just another one of those um, cautionary tales about celebrity and and the impact celebrity has on a lot of us in this country. I think I don't I don't I think that's that's a really big lesson here um, about just the whole O.J. Simpson story. And you know, don't kill your ex wife and her boyfriend. Um, and and if you have to pay restitution, pay it. Don't hide your assets from the family and then have them, you know, basically taking your estate when you die, leaving your children pretty much nothing because you refuse to pay them the restitution that you were ordered to by civil court. So that's his legacy. And there's, that's his fault. It's, it's all his fault. So 
I don't know what kind of conversations yeah. he's having in the afterlife, but hmm. <laughs> yeah, I actually saw an article that that claimed that OJ was like one hundred and fourteen million dollars in debt with uh, the Goldman because of you know basically he wasn't paying you know back the Goldman family. And there's even the story about how he basically had this ring of uh, businesses that dealt exclusively in cash mm -hmm. just to avoid having to uh, uh, pay back this restitution. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned Uptown Saturday night. This is kind of random. I was just on TikTok the other day, just scrolling. I don't post nothing on there. But there was like a clip of uh, Uptown Saturday night, and it was like the scene when John Amos and the other cat were arguing about territory and basically the other dude was like, well, we're coming to take over. And man, John Amos, John Amos was Biggie Smalls, right? Yep. Yeah, that's where that name comes from for yep. all the hip hop fans you may not know. Uh -huh. And man, he's standing there in his hat and his suit and he had like two gold teeth right <laughs> here. Clean. Yeah. Clean, boy. Sparkling. But, you know what I'm saying? He, he was talking bad. Like they was really talking some gangster stuff to each other. But yeah, and you know, this 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 response from black people to OJ, I think it speaks to something that we see a lot. And it is a response to mm -hmm. that same racist criminal legal system that sometimes causes us to heroize people who don't deserve to be heroized. So whether we're talking about OJ Simpson, Bill Cosby, R. Kelly, Ugh. Most recently, P. Diddy. Ooh. When, when, when a, a rich and powerful or prominent black man who has a history of you know problematic behavior of whatever sort, when that happens, all of a sudden he's treated like he's like Nelson Mandela or something. Right. And I think we just gotta find a better way to grapple with these different tensions of not wanting to legitimize a racist criminal legal system, but also making it clear that you can't just, you can't kill people, you can't rape people, you can't, you can't mistreat and abuse people. And because you're black and rich, we just let it go and just think it's cool or excuse it. You know what I mean? And so that is something that has just been going around uh, for a long time in terms of Black America. But of course, again, it's rooted precisely in our historical experience in this country. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I also can't help but feel like um, OJ, the way that trial played out, I don't know, maybe had an impact on kind of how mainstream society looked at uh, uh, athletes, and well, Black athletes specifically uh, in general, not that they were looked upon necessarily kindly uh, beforehand. So there's just so many ripple effects mm -hmm. um, from the O.J. Simpson trial that I think we still see in a number of ways to this day. I mean, the fact that he was even still in the public eye at all um, um, around the time of his death I think I think speaks to that. But I'm going to make the point again that it's this system that created the O.J. Simpson verdict. Mm -hmm. I would argue more so than 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 anything else. And that was just such an explosive time in this country and in L.A., like I was saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, the city was on fire. They had uprisings because of the Rodney King decision. And that's something else that had serious ripple effects throughout society. I mean, I'm, I'm bringing up hip hop again, but I mean, that, that that was a time when, you know, West Coast gangster rap was was still sort of on the rise. So mm -hmm. if you listen to The Chronic, which which is my favorite album, I have to yeah. say my favorite hip hop album of all time, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, they they had these <laughs> clips speaking to people in the community. I believe they were actually taken from like a documentary mm. that a filmmaker made about responses to oh. the Rodney decision. And you hear this interspersed throughout this quote gangster album. So amongst all the violence and misogyny and vulgarity and all of that, 
there's this clear like uh, level of political analysis, which is doubly interesting coming from Dr. Dre, who from the time of being in NWA all the way up until that point had tried very hard to like not be apolitical, but like anti-political. Mm -hmm. Because like in NWA, they were talking about, oh, well, you know, don't talk to me about that black stuff because I don't, you know, they didn't say stuff, but don't talk to me about that because I'm I'm not with that. While sampling the last poets, mind you. Right. And right. <laughs> Dr. Dre on the chronic on um, uh, what's the song I'm looking for? Oh, uh, on Let Me Ride, which I believe is track number three. Mm. He said, no medallions, long hair, or black fists. It's just that gangster glare. So again, I'm not on no Afrocentric vibe. I'm not rocking red, black, and green. I'm not on no righteous or what in LA they call high-powered. I'm not on that tip. But throughout that album, the, the political reality of what was happening in LA, in LA's black community, was very much there. And my favorite example of that on the album was on the song Little Ghetto Boy. Oh, of course, sample yeah. a classic song by the same name by Donny Hathaway. Mm -hmm. um, and in the beginning, while the music is queuing up, they're playing a clip. And it's this guy. And when you see the video, the man is actually holding his small son. But on the record, you hear him say, if I have to die today, for this little African right here to have a future, mm -hmm. then I'm a dead mf. Mm -hmm. And th there's just an emotional like weight to uh, uh, the whole thing in that sense. So I, I tend to think that they actually cared about it a lot more than they let on. Yeah. But to see how that rippled through hip hop, which is black youth culture at its mm -hmm. heart, I think really, really tells us something. Now you fast forward to today mm -hmm. with another rapper from LA, Kendrick Lamar, who mm -hmm. uh, wrote a song called <clears throat> We Gonna Be All Right, mm -hmm. that I can tell you as someone who was in the streets was basically the unofficial anthem that, that of was. that early part of the movement for black lives. Mm -hmm. You heard it, they were, we were blasting it at protest and all of that, but Kendrick performs that song at I want to say the Grammys, yep. huge platform, yes. national television. Mm -hmm. And for those who know the song, know that there's a line in there where he says, and we hate po -po -po -po. <laughs> when they shoot us <laughs> down in the down streets. The street show. show. But when he performed it at the Grammys, they cut that part out. Yes, they did. They did. Yes. Because because wasn't that the one, wasn't that the, his first performance at the Grammys? And that was the one where he did he and the the backups come out shackled and chained like they're going to prison. And yeah. you know, there's a there's a, a prison cell up as a part of the set, but as a part of the performance, there are also African dancers, right? So there's this clear mm. African theme, this clear liberation theme, this clear indictment of at least the criminal justice system. But then the censors, the white people who were the censors at the Grammys, they were like, I'm sure the conversation went like, okay, look, Kendrick, now we're going to let you have the jail cell and the, and the, and the torches on stage. We'll we'll let you have the African dancers. That's fine, but you cannot say this line. Well, that's that line is a part of the song. It's important. Pick and choose. <laughs> you have these things, or you can have that thing. Cho choose and and either that. I'm sure either choose, which is it, it, it's not a choice if they make you <laughs> right. But I'm sure the alternative was then you won't perform, right? Because I, I mean, the, these things are, we have to be really careful that we understand the whole context of, you know, our favorite performers, you know, coming out and saying these, you know, revolutionary and radical things. We have to understand when they are in the environment in which they make their money, they, it's, it's that they don't have the freedom to say in public in those environments. Uh, to say the things that they, that they put on the record that they, they don't. So, so to a certain degree, even that, that level of 
radical thought that's put into entertainment, that gets drowned out because it's not made public to the masses, right? So people who would never buy a Kendrick Lamar album, maybe they're watching the Grammys and they see what was really a, it was a fantastic performance. It was amazing. But when I'm, I'm waiting for that line and I'm like, wait, wait, we can't say we hate, we hate Popo because they shoot us down in the street for show. Isn't that the whole point of the song? So yeah, it, it, it was great because I'm sure he intended it as an anthem, maybe. We used it as an anthem, but we always have to remember that um, the people who prop up this capitalist system, uh, they'll give us money, but they will never let us say what we want on their platforms. That That's that's why we do this stuff, Sean. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, that, that Grammy performance, I just looked it up. It was in 2016, mm. which is two yeah. years. That was that after was Mike that? Brown was killed. Good. You know what I'm saying? And so we're still very much in this moment of a people struggle against racist police terror, but Kendrick can't say that line on stage. Right. Uh, and real quick, just want to remind folks, you're listening to Darker Than Blue on WPFW 89.3 FM in, in Washington, D.C. And when you look at the trajectory of Kendrick's music, uh, I, I mean, just to state the obvious, gifted rapper. Yeah. Incredible. Mm -hmm. I first heard Kendrick Lamar. There was this DJ from Atlanta. His name was uh, DJ Jamad. And he used to put out these mix shows called Afro Mentals. I used to listen to this all the time when I was in college. And I loved it because not only was it like, like new hip hop that I hadn't heard before, but he also mixed it in with like samples from like the movie Black Dynamite and stuff, oh, which man. did extra game. Yeah. yeah that, that. But Kendrick has always had like a level of um you know social and political commentary in his music. But like a lot of rappers, when you reach a certain level, you just don't hear that anymore. Mm -hmm. We could say the same for Kanye West. Did, you know, yeah. his first two or three out, you know, if we talk about a college dropout, brilliant late registration I mean. and graduation. You you hear that throughout, mm -hmm. but things happen. <laughs> and he said things happen. We, with we, I mean, Kanye is definitely still political now, but just not at all in the way that it was. <laughs> and and you, you can make the argument that you know, it's one thing for a rapper to like make a comment about something political it doesn't you know necessarily doesn't mean that they're dead prez or whatever you know right, right. And, and speaking of i actually remember and if if you remember this hit me up and let me know because you were really into hip-hop media if you remember this i remember one time double xl magazine back when rap magazines were like a thing that mattered he had like this they had this, their main story was like this round table discussion. And it was Kanye West. It was Dead Prez. I'm pretty sure Talib Kweli was there too. What? And this was like a group of, you know, nominally political rappers talking about, you know, music and entertainment and politics. And I thought that was so cool. And that's just, you just don't see that anymore. I feel like rappers either just basically have bad politics or they don't come in on it at all. It's like you look at someone like J. Cole, another gifted rapper. So another person, you know, I started listening to him in college. That was when he first started bubbling. And, and I would argue that he's earned his place in hip hop. But it's like he he makes, you know, kind of a social commentary and political sometimes, too, but then comes out and says things like, well, you know, I don't really read like that. <laughs> <laughs> And I feel like I have to mention that, you know, because we're talking about Kendrick Lamar and J. Cole. Kendrick recently put out this song that he tends to like to do every so often, where he basically calls out every other big rapper and dares them to say something about it. And they never really do because <laughs> like they can't rap as well as he can. <laughs> and, and J. Cole put out a response to the diss and the diss was whack. But then, J but that's that's actually not the worst part because that happens. The worst part, Jackie, is he went on stage at a show and apologized 
for making the diss track. Wait, now, Kendrick apologized or no, Cole? J. J. Cole. He apologized for Yeah. This is hip hop now. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Did he apologize because the diss was bad or that it was just not nice for him to do it? Okay, specifically what he was apologizing for, because in J. Cole's diss, he basically takes a swipe at um, Kendrick's album to Pimp a Butterfly, which was the big album that blew him up and that, you know, there's a consensus that it's a great album. It is a good album. I like Section 80 better, but the Pimp a yeah, Butterfly is cool. not his best, but it was good. Yeah. Um, and he was apologizing, basically saying, I was tripping for saying something bad about your album. And I'm just like, you know what? I, I saw, um, I was watching an a, a interview, not an interview. I was watching Bomani Jones' show. Uh, Bomani yeah. Jones, you know, is a black sports commentator. And I love watching him, even though I don't like sports. And he was talking about how, like, he was like, I remember the days when, when there was rap beef. Somebody didn't get to live to tell the story. <laughs> right. Like, right. People used to get murdered over rap beef. And I'm not saying it's right. It's not. No. I'm just saying the stakes used to be very different. <laughs> Real now people wow. are apologizing for dissing. The way it used to be is if if you had a whack diss, oh, you got clown for it, you got roasted. And we all for it. On. No, you got roasted for it wherever you went for a good yeah. six months. And if you came yeah. out your mouth salty at, at at any time in the future, oh, they would bring that up again. Oh, that's how you feel. Remember when you. <laughs> Exactly. But you, you had to hold that. But, but eventually, eventually we moved on. But I, Cole's made that difficult now because that's <laughs> and look, I'm not I'm not the most competitive person in the world. I don't proclaim to be a tough guy, but that was a sucker move, dog. Like I'm sorry. Okay, like, so <laughs> I, I haven't been able to figure out what genre J. Cole is supposed to be because to me. I know people are going to be unhappy with me again, but you know what? I'm used to it. I'm I'm good with that. To me, J. Cole is not a rapper. Mm. I, okay. I, Let's go. I just, I just, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I don't, there's, there's no, I feel like there is no passion. Like mm. he's, he's saying stuff, he's rapping stuff, but I just feel like he doesn't really believe it. <laughs> like I'm not convinced that you believe what you're saying because it doesn't sound convincing coming from you. And the whiny little, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Like the soft, gentle, oh my gosh, stop that. That's not, I don't want, oh, I will listen to jazz when I want that. But I want to listen to hip hop. I want to listen to hip This is not, J. Cole is not, uh-uh. I just, I feel a way about him and it's not a good way. <laughs> That that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, I mean, he definitely. I mean, look, he's not. You know, he he's not slinging dope and, and toting guns. Well, that's but true. I, mean, I, that I, I, I do, could be I do think. Yeah, he, I do think he fulfills like a particular role in a particular space in rap. And one thing that I will say that I appreciate about J. Cole is about through his whole Dreamville uh, record label, he has platformed and promoted you know, talented people who probably otherwise wouldn't be able to get a hearing in the mainstream music world. And I'm thinking about acts like um, Earth Gang, uh, which is a rap duo that, you know, a lot of people um, kind of compare to Outkast in terms of their style, that kind of, you know, spacey, you know, the mm -hmm. spacey black guys mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, and like Ari Lennox. Outside. Yeah, well, not quite like that, but Southern, basically. Oh, that's yeah. intriguing. Hmm. Yeah. And I would actually encourage you to check out Earth Gang, Jackie. I actually think you would dig them. I think that's up your alley. Um, yeah. Ari Lennox, who's a singer. Yeah, she's fantastic. Uh, who's great. I really enjoy her. Um, I think J.I.D. was on uh, Dreamville. And he honestly, J.I.D. actually sounds a lot like Kendrick to me. I don't know if that was the, the calculus behind it. But I mean, I appreciate that that aspect of them. But I mean, you know, it, it's just one of those things where, um, you know, people find their niche and and they really, you know, they really they really learn how to how to work it in that way. Yeah. So, you know, it it, it, it ain't always going to be everybody's cup of tea because I mean, Jay Z is like super popular, and I don't enjoy his music at all. 
No. Um, <laughs> now I did. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna like always hate him. I remember in like I think it was '96 when Volume Two came out, the one with the Hard Knock Life on it. I, you know, that's I got that. That sounds you know. about right. Yeah. 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 And you know, I, I got that. You know, of course, had to get the Walmart version. Parents wouldn't let me have the one with cussing <laughs> on it. But. <laughs> But, you know, and, and DMX was on it. So that automatically yeah. was going to get me, you know, in the I think track it was track number seven, money, cash, blank. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but 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 yeah. And even um, his first album, you know, but, and because my favorite Jay-Z song easily is Can I Live? You know what I mean? With the, um, the, the Isaac Hayes walk on by sample. Mm -hmm. I mean, his uh, his cadence there was just so crazy, especially that part. Where he says, you know, like the way he uses emphasis, like, you know, presidential suites, my residential for the weekend, confidentially speaking in code. If I catch like he was he was ripping. He was ripping. Yeah, yeah. But, I'll give him that much. I, but I just I just get sick of dude after a while. Like, <laughs> especially, And I think what really kind of ended me even giving Jay-Z a chance was when he came out with the death of Autotune. Because he sent that song at T Pain, yeah, he for did. his finest export, the <laughs> Tallahassee hero himself. So the it was man a personal who, insult to you, Sean. Hey, to quote Michael Jordan, I took that personally. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I took that personally because, as people know, if y'all have listened to us for a while, you know that there was an era when Southern rap was on the rise and the East Coast uh, rappers were uh, looking down on them. And so that still gets to me a little bit. Now, to be fair, Jay-Z wasn't one of those people. He actually is the one that brought UGK to the mainstream, which includes my favorite rapper, Pimp C, but even still. And so you're talking about the man, T-Pain, who took what Troutman and Zap made mm -hmm. and remade it yep. for the modern day. Mm -hmm. And you're just brushing it off because to you it's not cool, yeah. mind you. But 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 what happened later? We got future. <laughs> we got yeah. we got rich homie. Qu we got all of these rappers mm -hmm. who had an auto tune sound to the point where they really did overdo it a lot. Yeah, they did. A they lot did. of them they used auto tune to compensate for the fact that they didn't make very good music. Mm -hmm. But it it wasn't it wasn't a good and that was that was really the trend. Every every fool that wanted to be a rapper <laughs> set up a microphone in his closet and got somebody to put seventeen layers of auto tune on his vocals. <laughs> Just mess. Just mess. And we don't hear it so much anymore. But T Pain has entered like this elder statesman stage of his career. Mm -hmm. I mean, he put out an album full of covers. He has what is my favorite tiny desk. I mean, you know, I, I I never thought that we'd get like a basically an acoustic version of "Buy You a Drink." Yeah, <laughs> you know that was that fire was though. <laughs> crazy. Jay Z came at that. <laughs> you know, like how dare you? And while I'm talking about this, let me also say that Jay Z, because one of my favorite rappers is a juvenile from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. You know, Cash Money Records. And his first big single was called Ha, H-A. Mm -hmm. And on the album, there's a remix to Ha mm -hmm. that features Jay-Z. Terrible. <laughs> that, that, is verse a funny song, Z, <laughs> that verse from Jay-Z was terrible. It was <laughs> unnecessary. And only people from New York like it. Wow. <laughs> and if anyone, if you're a rap fan, you know what I'm saying is true. <laughs> You know that you know that verse was trash. Be honest it wasn't, with yourselves. Don't stop trying. Don't ride Juvie's wave. All right, <laughs> you ride your own wave. You know? That is a funny song, though. I I I love that song. It's a funny song because it it, was great. it it sounds like exactly the way my family. Thought. Oh, you thought you were gonna do this, huh? Oh. <laughs> Oh, you thought you were going to just go down there and get yourself a man, huh? Oh, you thought you were just going to go in there and tell the people off, huh? That's like, Jesus, my granddaddy wrote this song for this boy. And he, and he rapped it. <laughs> and see, and Jackie, what you just said is something that I think a lot of people still miss uh, on that song. 
because I think people thought he was just, I don't know, doing something funny or gimmicky. But in New Orleans, they talk like that. Yes, they, they, do. they do put how on the end of their senses like that sometimes. Yeah. And that one was so beautiful about juvenile and cash money records is they were so thoroughly and unashamedly New Orleans rappers. Now, Master P had came before them, but No Limit Records, even though they rep New Orleans, it, it, it didn't really have that same kind of flavor to it. And what makes all the difference, I think, is Manny Fresh. Because what Manny Fresh did is he took the regional sound of bounce music and made that into hip hop. He made rap beats off of bounce music, which already has elements of rap in it, right. as we know. And so I, I think that, that that sonic landscape that they built, when we heard it, it, it literally was like nothing we'd ever heard before because we hadn't heard anything mm -hmm. like that. We, 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 in, in hip hop, we didn't know what New Orleans sound like. We know about jazz, mm -hmm. we know about ragtime, you know, we know about the food and the culture and all of that, but what does a rapper from New Orleans sound like? Mm -hmm. Cash Money Records showed us and Juvenile showed us better than anyone. And who else, you know, spurred, if you will, out of Cash Money Records, Little Wayne, oh, one of the biggest rappers in the world. Hmm. Hmm? Is that what, that's where he came, okay. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You see, yeah. I never pay that much attention to the, you know, all, all of that stuff. I either like the music or I don't. <laughs> and, and if I yeah. don't, then I just don't pay attention to anything they ever do. Um, but, you know, I, I like, I'm glad that you mentioned T-Pain being like an elder statesman now. Because I saw him do one of the coolest things that that I wish more artists would do would be brave enough to do here's t pain you know the 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 pioneer of auto tune and hip hop uh and, and rap um but was a a good rapper is a good rapper even without the auto tune that's and and that's why i think the auto tune really worked because without it there were good raps and and he's got a great voice but the auto tune just took it somewhere else right but here's this man who is, you know, now the elder state statesman of hip hop. I can't remember the band he was singing with, but he's singing in public um, Black Sabbath's War Pigs. And this is not, this is not, it's not a hard song to do, but if you are not into metal, you would not pay any attention to it but it's one of the best classic metal songs because of the message and because of the guitars and the drums. And Ozzy Osbourne's voice, Black Sabbath, the original singer of the song, Ozzy Osbourne, I've never liked that man's voice, but War Pigs is one of my favorite songs because it's just, it just, it just shreds and it just hits you over the head and it's perfect. T-Pain knocked that junk out of the box. I mean, it was, I was just like, oh, he has metal chops too. So, I mean, it was just, it was great to see a, a, a rapper, a hip hop artist cross over and not be afraid to do it and be fantastic at it. So that's like, okay, what else have you got up your sleeve that we don't know about? That's, so I'm always looking to see what else he's doing because there's got to be something else. Yeah, so talented. Went, went broke. Did. Went broke and rebuilt, yeah, and rebuilt his fortune. Yeah, he, he he talks about that. I mean, you know, classic story of spending too much, mismanagement, people mm -hmm. stealing, probably all of all of that sort of thing. And you know, one thing and another reason why I, since we're just loving on T Pain right now, we That's can't do right. that enough. <laughs> one of my favorite songs that T Pain made, and if you're from Florida, you're gonna feel me on this. The song is called Dance Floor. Now, if you look this song up and listen to it, you'll think, oh, this is just a nice little upbeat kind of danceable song. But the sound of that song is the sound of what we would call juke music. So mm -hmm. it's like this particular style of music that we had in Florida that mostly emanated from South Florida. 
um, that was always connected to the dance. So we was we was juking, we was we was Wu Tang, and even though I think that comes from Jersey, all of that. And so when we hear dance floor, we know that T Pain made that for us. So, yeah, Jersey you know, calls we, everything. We all all the yeah, absolutely. Huh? I said Jersey calls everything Wu Tang. By the way, that's that's just you know, that's just their thing. Really? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> well, uh, that's going to do it for today here on Walking in Blue on WPFW 89.3. Stay tuned for news and reviews with Garland Nixon coming up next, and we will see you next time. Peace. <laughs>
and and you know not tell people that you know what they can and cannot listen to because this ain't church. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know nobody's gonna want to do. It. Nobody should be walking up in here telling people in these organizations telling people what they should and shouldn't listen to. Certainly don't tell people what they shouldn't watch because man, if people come to my house and see what I watch. <laughs> television they would they would have me under observation probably <laughs> so <clears throat> i had a couple comrades over sunday night uh cuz we had a bunch of meetings um uh monday uh starting early monday morning and going until like 2 or 3 o'clock uh, <laughs> so they're here and i'm i'm making something for us to eat and I'm going in the kitchen and I'm I'm getting them a couple of beers. And I come back and I was like, you know, here's the remote. Just, you know, find what you want. Make yourself at home, take shoes off, whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> so my comrade <laughs> turns the television on in the living room and he's scrolling past. And I have a, a what is this stupid thing? A fire TV. Um, I did not intend to get a fire TV, but that's what it is. So he's just scrolling through everything that's on my watch list. And I come in with his beer and he's like, African. Ain't nothing but murder, death, murder, death, killing, murder, death, uh, uh, conspiracies, plots, murder, death on this TV. Is this all you watch? And I was like, listen, comrades, I really like my white on white crime shows. I really like these true crime shows where most of them are talking about all the myriad ways white people, uh, mostly white people, have killed each other for the most ridiculous, ignorant, and stupid reasons, but they do it. I love these shows. I love them. I, I don't know what the draw is, but <clears throat> I just tell people, Look, these are these are my white on white crime shows. <laughs> Leave me alone, um, you know. Because honestly, uh, and and I think we've talked about this before. Um, honestly, it's it's kind of a distraction, right? To to to, to read uh, a fiction that isn't political, to watch television shows that are not political, to listen to music that is not always political. Sometimes it's it's an escape. And, and I'll tell you what I mean. Um, I love being an organization. I really do because I need guardrails. I don't know about you. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm, I, I don't like to tell people what to do. And I don't, I don't like to talk about stuff I don't know that I have not personally experienced. So when I tell these kind of stories, I talk about what I've experienced. Your experiences may be different. I hope they are. <laughs> but um, I love being in an in, in organization and I do love it because I have learned a level of discipline that I probably wouldn't have been able to develop on my own. Um, I don't like meetings. I don't like, uh, I, I'm not terribly social. I don't like working on teams with, I'm, I'm just really awful, but <laughs> Being in an organization has really helped me get over that that isolationism, that that um, uh, individualism. I do have a very individualistic freak uh, <laughs> streak. I am sometimes also an individualistic freak. But anyway, um, <laughs> so I I do like to to be alone, be by myself, do my own thing. I I you know. Like I'm always like, nope, I don't need help. And that's never true. Um, but I have learned in organization that nothing good that is going to benefit all of us <clears throat> in the struggle for liberation gets done by individuals. It all gets done by people who are in a collective working toward the same goal. Um and working on tasks together to complete that goal, right? So being an organization <clears throat> has taught me to respect and really cherish the collective discipline, 
that you get from being an organization. And I actually like to think of it as like soft discipline. If you think about that, uh, if you think about discipline as kind of a soft thing, there are different levels of discipline. And I'm, you know, when I, when I say things like, I don't like conflict, people get annoyed and are like, well, nobody likes conflict. I'm like, well, how many people do you know? Cause I know a whole bunch of petty ass people who are literally waiting for a conflict at least once a day to make themselves feel alive. I know plenty of people who love to fight, love it. They will argue with you over whether the sky is blue. That's just how they are. So yeah, some people actually do love conflict. I don't. I don't love conflict, but I'm in a leadership position and sometimes conflict happens and I got to deal with those things. I don't like it. I don't like it. It's the last thing I want to do, but it is a part of my responsibilities as a leader in an organization. So you know what I have to do? I have to put my my dis um disdain because it really is like I hate conflict. I don't like to be in the same room when other people are fighting. That that's why I won't watch certain shows. <laughs> um so I um I had to be brought into the collective. And I had to learn how to love being a part of a connect, a collective, because I had to be shown the benefits of working in a collective. And for a workaholic, can't say no type of person like me, um, I don't think I'm type A, but I'm, I'm, I'm an A minus probably, probably more like a B plus a type of B plus. Um, yeah, Yipper 99, why not? <clears throat> Excuse me, if real if if Real Housewives does it for you, watch Real Housewives. I I don't care. Um you know, just just do something that 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 takes your mind away from everything that we have to focus on all the all the rest of the time. You deserve a break too. You need a break too. You have to take care of yourself too in organization because this is not a sprint. This fight is not going to be over tomorrow, next week, probably not even next year. This is a marathon. And, and if we got to step back and, and get away from some of this just to collect our peace of mind, please do it. Please do, because there's a lot of work to be done. So, so like I, I had to learn to love the collective, right? To love the processes and the progress that you can make when you are in a collective, as opposed to when you're doing all the things by yourself and you're trying to do all the things by yourself. So, so let me give you this real quick example. So I, I, like I said, don't like conflict. I'm in leadership. I have to deal with conflict. I don't want to, <laughs> but it is my responsibility to, because I'm responsible for these people in my region. You know, and, and it is not a small thing to me that I was given this responsibility. I don't, we did, there, there, there are no personality kind of things here. People aren't just passing out leadership positions because they like people. Some of that's not, I don't know what it was that people saw in me, but they saw something and, and said, she would be great to, to, to be the coordinator for the Mid-Atlantic region and to, to, to coordinate the DC citywide Alliance. I didn't see what they saw. I I'd still kind of don't, but I value being in the collective that has my back and that helps me do things and that I can talk to and ask them, am I looking at this from the right perspective? Can this be better? Can we do this a different way? Can you help me do this? Or, you know, that's the beauty of being in a collective. None of this is all on your shoulders. Everybody is supposed to be bearing all of the weight of this struggle collectively. And even despite what it is we're doing in organization, we should be sharing it evenly as much as we can. Even though we're not doing the same thing, we can share the equal, we can share the burden of this struggle equally, right? By just being present, by showing up, by contributing as much as you can. Nobody can be there all the time, but if we've made a commitment to an organization, 
that organization is where we should where we should be a lot of the time, right? So <clears throat> I'm in this leadership position, don't want to deal with conflict, have to. So you know what I do? Which is something I've I, I don't like doing. I ask for help. <laughs> I I talk to my co-coordinator for DC, the coordinator for Baltimore, and the co-coordinator for the regional for uh BAP Mid-Atlantic Regional. I present stuff to them. I, I love writing stuff up, putting my thoughts on paper, because in my head, my thoughts make perfect sense. Perfect sense. When I put it on paper, that's where it's like, that is the most ridiculous thing. How could I think that made sense? That's not even a sentence, right? <laughs> so so I, I put things down on paper before I talk to people so I can have a roadmap of what to say. Um, so I'm not just sitting there kind of thinking of uh, why do I have you here <laughs> and, and that kind of thing. And so I can keep the conversation to the issues at hand and not stray off when people are very likely to stray off in a conversation with leadership when they really don't want to talk about their stuff. Right. So that's that's what I do. I I say to people who I trust. This is what I, I think I need to address with, with these particular people. Is it on point? Do I have something wrong? Do I need more information? Is it the right tone? Give me feedback. I never used to do that. I never used to do that. Never. And it wasn't that I thought I was the smartest person in the room and you know I didn't need anybody's help. It was that I didn't trust people because I'd been I'd been mistreated so much. So when mistakes were made, when I did work on projects with other people, who was blamed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just figure if I'm gonna if I'm gonna get blamed, if I'm gonna get mistreated for work I do, if I'm gonna mis get mistreated for anything, it's gonna be something I actually do. That it is not going to be because the other people I worked on the project with didn't want to take responsibility for their failures and they decided to blame me. Yeah, that's not. So there's the, so so my isolationism and individualism is very much born out of trauma from being mistreated by people I have worked with that I know where that comes from. I, I don't even need to spend time on a psychologist for that. It is very interesting to me, though, that being in an organization is what kind of broke me out of that. And I don't know how that happens. I don't know how it works. I just I just know that for me, that worked. And, and I think because I was so um, excited about that and the work that they were doing. I, I think that's what it was. Um, we love the fact that they put out that back we, me and Abdus, when he before he passed away, we love the fact that they put out so information, so much information, just just with 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 history and details. Loved it. It's like these Africans is smart, <laughs> right? And that's great. This isn't dogma. This isn't, you know, hyperbole. This isn't, you know, a bunch of catchphrases. This is the truth. These Africans serious. So when it came to doing more BAP organized work, it was like, what, where, where I go? Where, where, where we going? <laughs> and really for me and Abdus, that was like literally our response all the time. It's like, oh, you need us to do, you need us to show up at the Capitol at this. Okay. You know, you need to, us to go to this event. Okay. We'll do it. And, and, you know, we were excited about BAP. Um, and, and I remain excited about BAP because, you know, I think the work we are doing is exciting, number one, because we are, we're educating our communities. We are trying to show our people who are unconscious, unconscious, um, that they are unconscious by showing them their unconscious behavior by showing them that hey all of this celebrity worship and you know you can you can listen to Beyonce and and enjoy her music but everything that come out of that woman's mouth ain't gospel cuz she's a capitalist and she don't care about you 
<laughs> she just she just wants you to buy her album and buy her overpriced concert tickets. She doesn't really care about whether you're being exploited by your boss. So the words to that song, oh, you can't break my soul. Yeah, that, those are just words to a song, right? And and it's <clears throat> it it has been a very interesting journey to be for me to be more comfortable asking for help. Um, I really had to do that when I had the surgery and was cover recovering from the surgery because I couldn't get up. I couldn't I couldn't get up and and you know go downstairs whenever I was hungry. You know, it took me a minute to get to the bathroom because I'm you know bending over and, and two surgeries actually. Um, so I, I, I needed help. And when I went through these things, I just happened to be in an organization that taught me how to love the collective and how to lean on the collective when I needed help. Not everybody is qualified to be leaned on because everybody in the collective actually isn't contributing to the collective. And that's true of every organization. Right. But uh, but for the people who, you know, you can depend on, um, it is life changing to be able to say to your collective, your community, I'm going to need some help with people like bringing me something to eat, um, making sure I don't fall when I get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. You know, just somebody at the house with me to make sure that I'm safe and I'm OK. And and people were like, man, please stop. Tell me when, when I'll tell you when I can be there. Let me know if it's good. And I, there was a schedule. People had a schedule of when, what day and what time they would come over to my house and help me. If I were not in an organization, I would not have that kind of community because, because the people I, I went to church with before I, when I, when I met Abdus and would, by the time we got married, after we got married, I don't know where they went, but <laughs> they were not around as much. Now, I we left their church. <laughs> that might explain things. I left two of the churches where I met most of the people uh, that in my church community. But I left both of those churches. So I guess they were like, well, she's a heathen now. So. <laughs> So I'm like, all right, I'm a heathen. But we left those churches because they weren't political. Because they were not political at all. They weren't talking about anything that black folks were struggling with. Nothing, nothing. So I couldn't be a part of it. And I wasn't even as, um, I wasn't as aware of as much then as I am now. But even then I knew, man, I got to get, I got to get away from these people. Cause all they talking about is praying and Mike Brown laid in the street for four hours after he was shot by Darren Wilson. Why are we not? You, you know, it, so it, 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 it got to a point, And I think that was around the time of, um, uh, Tamir Rice as well. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was wondering, so when are we going to talk about these things? The church, one church I belong to. Um, and why don't we just talk about church? Because I've been promising to do it for a minute, but, you know, I'm going to be better prepared next time. But this is the, consider this the intro conversation, because um, next week, of course, we have Dr. Linwood Tawheed for the third Friday, Black uh, Blackonomically speaking, but maybe on Fourth Friday we'll talk a little bit more about it. But yeah, so so the church experience was interesting because I was attending one church that was diverse, that was in like suburban Virginia, and I was just like, I just I just would like to go to a diverse church for once in, in my life and see if they say something different. They weren't, um, but. <laughs> This church in Virginia that was relatively diverse was apolitical about everything until Barack Obama ran for president. And these people got in on the whole, he's a secret Muslim, um, you know, he's going to destroy America and all this kind of <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. You know, so, so it was like, yeah, I can't. And, and emails from the pastor's wife connecting Barack Obama with a, a, the, a church that was burned down and people were in the church by uh, Islamic uh, 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 extremists in Nigeria. And, and because Barack Obama is related to a Nigerian family, oh, it, he must be related to these Islamic terrorists who burned down this church with the Christians in it. And I, I remember I cussed out the pastor's wife. Like, are you serious? Where are you getting your news from? And 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 it wasn't even a situation of defending Barack Obama because, I mean, I had kind of peeped that he was, he might be a problem, but I was like, I'm going to vote for him anyway, because maybe, maybe he'll get something. We always see how that worked out, but okay. So, so I'm like, lady, where are you getting your news from? I, I don't, why would you connect that issue of this uh, <clears throat> church being burned down by uh, 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 Islamic extremists in Nigeria. Why would you relate that to Barack Obama? What? What? He? He's related to families in Nigeria. It's like, so what? I have, I have families. I'm sure I have, you know, family uh, where you live. So, and, I mean, if if somebody steals your car, and you you gonna blame me? Because I got I'm like, what do you? And 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 I remember saying to her, like. Why do you think posting to the entire church listserv something like this is a godly or a Christian thing to do? You, If you don't like Barack Obama's politics, that's fine. Criticize the man's politics. But you are accusing him of something that, number one, he didn't do. And you're accusing him of it because... He has Muslim family in Africa, one of his cousins or something or other like that, because his, remember, his father was Nigerian, I believe. So it's like, so, so you are uh, uh, playing guilt by association with Barack Obama because his daddy is related to um, uh, Obama's in Nigeria. Right. So the, the church being burned down wasn't burned down by anybody named Obama. It was burned down. So do you understand? So this one, because they hated Barack Obama so much because he was black. I'm talking about white Christians in a Kenyan. Thank you. Not Nigerian. Can you Kenyan? Thank you. Helpful harm. Thanks for correcting me. I need correction sometimes, y'all, because I'd be wrong sometimes. This brain is full of full of medication. Who knows what's going on up there half the time? Kenyan, his dad was Kenyan. Thank you so much. I'm getting my African countries mixed up. But this was a church. All the leadership was white. I was in youth ministry. All the kids in youth ministry were white. Um, all the other youth ministers were white. And I said to the youth minister one day, because he gets up there in the pulpit and he's talking about, you know, oh, we need to take our country back. We need to protect our country from, you know, the godless infidels. And I'm like, who exactly were you talking about taking your country back? Or who stole who stole America from you? And we were in the church, in the <laughs> in the multipurpose room for the youth ministry. And I, and I said, you know, Pastor Gary, I, I was really offended by your speech today. Why were you offended? I mean, you don't think that Barack Obama is a threat? I'm like, he is no much of a threat. He's no greater of a threat than Bush, than Reagan, than Clinton. They're, they're all the same. Nixon, they're all the same. They're all the same. So what is your beef with Barack Obama? Have you all been this upset? I mean, have you done this before? Have you responded this way before where you're making public statements from the pulpit? about a, a, a political candidate. Have you done this before? He's like, well, you know, not really, but this is a, a, a unique threat. And the kids start coming into the room and I'm like, this is not a unique threat. Y'all just hate black people. Really, that's really it. And oh my God, the white people were like, oh no, 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 that's not it. No, 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 I'm not racist. I don't have a racist bone in my body. 
usually people who say that they don't have a racist bone in their body, the whole fucking spine is racist. The whole thing. The, the spine is made of, of solidified, calcified Confederate and Nazi flags. They, they are racist, right? But these people really hated them some Barack Obama and they knew nothing about him. They knew nothing about his politics. You know, and, and there was already plenty to critique because the man was in <clears throat> the Senate in Chicago. <laughs> and they ain't like him. Uh, what's his name? Um, John McCain. Uh, in, 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 yeah, in, in uh, uh, Illinois, I think. Yeah. John McCain was like, I don't like this dude because he seems shady. <laughs> But maybe he'll turn um turn into something. John McCain said that about Barack Obama in Barack Obama's first term in the Illinois Illinois Senate, I think, uh, yeah, something or other like that. So he had a track record. All we had to do was look it up, and I did. And I was like, yeah, he seems like kind of a liberal asshole. But maybe you know that hope thing. <laughs> which we should never have for politicians in politics. Um, but they did that. And and it was very um, antagonistic. And it became impossible to go to church because the people don't understand the way the right wing built up the power that they did. And people always say, oh, the right wing, well, the way they did it is they're funded and the left isn't. That's that's a part of it. But that's not all of it because it really came down to organization. Look, somebody could be giving you all the money in the world, but if you do not have an organized plan to reach people, with whatever it is you want to reach people with, all that money is going to go to waste. If you don't have a plan for how to engage with people with your message. So the evangelical Christian nationalists, which is what I'm calling the Christian right these days, the evangelical Christian nationalists, the white evangelical Christian nationalists, organize themselves. That's what they did with all that money, right? That what they did some marketing stuff and they, 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 uh, uh, paid for, um, local campaigns for people who ran for every office that was available for them to run in. If it was dog catcher, these people recruited people from among their community to run for dog catcher. Because what would happen is that person is now a part of the government and that person can now move up in the government. Start at dog catcher, maybe you can uh, run for, uh, put your name in on the ballot for a recorder of deeds, right? Then if you get that, if you win that, then maybe you can uh, run for say, Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, 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 maybe you can uh, um, run to be on the city council or the school board. That's what the money paid for. These campaigns across the country for these little penny ante offices at the local level that Democrats paid no attention to whatsoever. Whatsoever. And Republicans organized and said, we're going to put our people in these offices. And that's what they did. They also did something that I always tell people that they missed, that they shouldn't have. A lot of that money also went to obviously printing propaganda. What did they do with a lot of propaganda? Because you probably didn't see a lot of it during that time. What they did was they printed a whole bunch of voters guides for every state. Every state, the major cities in those states, if they were engaging with a particular church, they had voters guides for the elections in the county that church is in, in the city that the county is in, in the state 
that the city is in. <clears throat> right? So all of these churches full of white evangelical Christians got a bunch of voters guides printed by these right-wing organizations. And the voters guides would have everyone who is running for the major offices that they're concerned about, um, that the Republicans are concerned about in that area. And then they would put on the voters guide what those uh, Republican candidates stood for. And then they put the Democratic candidates on the other side of the of the guide and what they stood for, which of course is always in opposition to what the Republicans stood for. You don't know how many churches across this country received those voters guides. So for people who literally stole the model of organizing from leftists from the early days of labor organizing in and, and civil rights organizing in this country. Yes, the tactics the right wing uses, they stole them from us. <laughs> and I don't know how that happened, but I think that was appropriate. <laughs> so, they are using our tactics to organize their base. And we are sitting here talking about, I'm not going to join no organization. It's a bunch of messed up people in organizations. Last time I was in an organization, I had a fist fight with somebody. Last time I was in an organization, the leader stole the money. Last time I was in an organization, I don't give a shit about last time you, know, you were in an organization. Organizations are, are like any other institution. There's got some messed up people in them who will do some messed up things. If you don't like that organization, find one that fits. But stop acting as if we can do something different, that we can do something other than organize to win, because we cannot. We can't. We can't win. We can't defeat this system just because we're angry at it, just because we understand it, just because we we know all of the 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 contradictions within the system. Our dialectical materialism is not going to topple this system, but the organized anger of the masses will absolutely do it. And if you can't look at the rise of the Tea Party and the right wing in this country and the way they organized to do it as evidence that no impactful action in regard to the government or much of anything else in this country can be made without grassroots bottom up organizing. That's what the Republicans did. That's why all these school boards are uh, voting to ban books. That's why they're closing libraries, literally closing libraries in schools banning uh, um, appropriate gender bathrooms for kids in school. It just, it, it's, this is a result. This is not a, the result of, of just money, of just the money Republicans have or conservatives have, because not, <laughs> not every conservative is actually a Republican. There are plenty of Democratic conservatives. And how come nobody gives any smoke to the libertarians ever? <clears throat> but this, they could not have achieved the long lasting success that they have in infiltrating and influencing the government had they not made the decision to organize at the grassroots in churches. That's another thing we won't do because we're leftists and we think that we have transcended the need for spirituality or religion, that we're smarter than that now. But we forget a lot of our people are where? In church. And, and I know that the messaging is <laughs> confusing at best. But our people are still there. So if we want to talk to them, 
If we want to get them to understand what it is that is a problem, that is the real problem for all of us, we have to go to them. I don't understand this thing where we think that we that that we are we are providing political education, but we're expecting everyone to come to us. We, we so special and we so fancy that we expect all we have to do is put up some flyers and everybody is just going to flock to our shit. That is not how it works. Nobody cares about you and what you're talking about unless they know you care about them. And how do you get to care about people? You have to talk to them. You have to. So, so we're going to have to organize in some of these churches. I know the messaging is fucked up. I know it is. But we're not there in these spaces for the messaging. We're not getting involved in churches to be saved. The Republicans, the conservatives did not start organizing in churches because they wanted to be saved because they didn't get, no, they wanted votes. So what is it that we want? Do we want our people to be made conscious, conscious? I can never pronounce that word right. Made conscious of their unconsciousness. Do we want to wake people up to the fact that they are asleep to what's really going on by pointing out how they act like they're asleep by just believing everything that comes out? That's our job. We're supposed to do that. And the only way we can do that is do that is if we go to the people. But we have to be organized to do it. We really do. There is no getting around it. <clears throat> now, about religion, I have said this before. Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I said it last year, but it bears repeating. And I feel the same way about people who have um, dietary restrictions or, or preferences. Um, you know, I have a good friend who is a um, vegan. Uh, so she does not eat any animal products. She she does not she does not believe in killing animals. She's you know she is an absolute uh, a vegan in 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 every ideological sense. And I respect her. She's funny. I love her so much. But I don't care what she puts on my plate. I don't care what she puts on her plate. I just really don't. It's not my concern. It doesn't have anything to do with organizing people. Now. Do we have to organize vegans? Absolutely. And she's the perfect person to do that. Because I'm going to offend you because I'm going to have a bologna sandwich. Maybe not bologna because now my taste buds are like, I don't think we like bologna anymore. It's not refined enough for us. We would like some smoked turkey and black forest ham and some roast beef. Yeah. So maybe not bologna anymore. You know, but but organizing with other people, organizing in an organization, it doesn't mean that you believe or that you agree with everyone in the organization that you, you don't have to like everyone. Everybody is not your friend. But you should agree with the principles of unity, the mission, the vision of the purpose of the organization. If you agree with those things, then all the other people are there because they agree with those things and y'all ought to be able to work together. And y'all ought to be able to figure out that you're going to need to break out of your comfort zone and go to some places and do some things and talk to some people you don't want to. Because we're not just organizing to win an election. We're, we're not organizing to tell people to vote. I'm not interested in whether you are going to vote or not. Mm -mm. Uh, I'm not. What I want to know is, do you understand that regardless of which party you vote for, the outcome is the same for us, right? So instead of talking to people about voting, I want to talk to people about what they think they get for their vote. What do they see as the benefit for their vote? And what do they see as the benefit for voting for one party representative over the other? You can't have these conversations with people, um, you know, who 
you're not willing to talk to. Actually, that's really just the bottom line. So, yeah, you know, organizing has been a, a benefit for me. Um, and, and not because of any kind of recognition or anything. I just think that organizing has improved me um, to be more willing uh, to interact and engage with people um, to the point that, yeah, I will um, talk to people, just walk up to people on the street and talk to them when we're out canvassing. You, you get comfortable doing that, or at least, or at least you learn how to do it and, and, and you can get, and you can endure, it. <laughs> you know, because people in organizations, um, everybody doesn't have to love everything they do, right? Everybody isn't going to get the, 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 the exciting, um, tasks, right? Um, you, you usually can't just go into an organization and be like, oh, I'm going to speak at the next protest. No, you're not. You're not. Because we don't know how much you know. Um, you haven't been to any uh, internal PE. You haven't, we, you haven't been to any meetings. We haven't really spent time with you. So we don't really know how your ideology really is. So when you first get into an organization, you might not get to do some of the exciting, you know, flashy in, you know, upfront kind of things. But you will meet a lot of people who are pretty cool. Most people in organization, I think are pretty decent, pretty cool people. You will learn new things like public speaking, but everybody won't take to that. Everybody doesn't want to do public speaking, but for the people who do, you'll learn how to do it and you will become more comfortable in doing it. And with the internal study, here's the thing. You learn these skills, right? But with the internal political education, what you also learn is sharpness. You also learn to hone your ideology, your understanding of the ideology will become so sharp that yes, you will easily be able to have a conversation with a person, a stranger on the street. Now, now that's not because of the training, uh, um, you know, training uh, uh, for public speaking. That that comes from um, learning the ideology, internalizing the ideology making the ideology a part of you because the ideology is about you, right? That's that's a part of that. That's a part of it. And look, there are people who don't ever want to be seen, who don't, they do not want to do any public speaking. Don't ever ask them to speak in public. They do not want to do um, outreach. They don't want to be talking to people in it. Cool. Fantastic. We always need people to take notes in meetings. Right. We, we, we always need people to do that boring. I hate to call it grunt work, but that's that's how some people see it. You know, we need somebody to make the copies because we cannot always afford to go to FedEx or Kinko's and make 500 copies. So, you know, we need somebody with access to uh, an industrial printer that we can that we can. Um, um, uh, what's oh, what is the word? Uh, commandeer, yes, that we can commandeer for a few hours to print some flyers, right? Or we need people who can create flyers, people who are creative and great with graphics. And yeah, you, you don't have to be out front to do that. No, you know, we need people to call people, <laughs> you know, it, it's there's so much that needs to be done to maintain an organization, especially an organization that's growing and that's active, there's a little something for everybody. There's a little something for everybody to be done. Um, and a lot of the times, if, if you can't find a place where you fit, we'll, we'll, we'll create a space for you as long as you want to do the work. So, ah, that was nice after this week that has been kind of crazy. Oh, I, I have to show you that uh, another fantastic book that I'm looking forward to reading has arrived, Two Blacks Laundering Black Rage, The Washing of Black Death, People, Property, 
and Profits uh, by Two Black and Rasul uh, Moat just came. Cannot wait to read it. Uh, I'll probably start reading it a little bit more this evening. Um, what else is going on? What else is going on? I, I don't think I have a whole heck of a lot of stuff that's going on. I've been catching up with uh, a lot of paperwork that I've had to do. <laughs> um, a lot of writing, a lot of stuff that I've had to do. Uh, I, I got a little carried away with Timu. But in, in my defense, in my defense, I, I needed those things, right? Like I needed a new grease can because I, I didn't have one and it was glass and it's really nice, right? So, okay, so, and um, the garden stuff, I'm, I'm gonna have people over to help me garden. So I needed the extra stuff. And, and I mean, those little, you know, ankle height um, wellies, they're adorable. I mean, where else would I gotten, would I've gotten those for so cheap? I just, I did, I got a little bit carried away with Timu. I'm sorry, I'll do better, but I, planning season, what do you want? Um, <laughs> uh, so let's see, so that's that. Um, I'm trying to think of something that's coming up publicly, but I know we are preparing for Af of, uh, of, of African Liberation Day. What's a copy of, huh? A copy of AMP. Okay, I'm, what, what's going on? <laughs> what's AMP? What are you setting me up for, Musa? <laughs> um, so... I know we are planning um, some a, a teach-in uh, leading up to African Liberation Day. Then there is African Liberation Day on May 28th, I believe, in Baltimore. Uh, we'll be all out there. Um, <laughs> I know my billionaire lifestyle, but this is funny. So I, I, I toast. I, I posted. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's that's Moose's book, Alive and Paranoid. I actually do need that book. Hmm, I do. Cause I yeah, I read the the one poem and it was beautiful. And I was like, oh what? Wait, maybe I do like poetry. <laughs> I I have this thing against poetry. <laughs> it just but you know, good poetry I like. That that um what was her name? Amanda. I can't remember her last name, but the little girl who read the poem for uh, Obama's inauguration. Oh, Jesus. Not, none of that. None of that. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Um, so, yeah, we we will uh, have a public teach in leading up to African Liberation Day. Uh, date and time for that will be uh, published soon. African Liberation Day, May 28th in Baltimore, uh, I believe. and. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, a whole lot of other stuff going on. Uh, my last update for this show is a very good update. Um, very exciting for me. So I made a deal with my doctors at the um, Georgetown University Kidney Tra uh, 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 Transplant in Institute because they told me that I couldn't fly until June. <laughs> and, and I was like, come on, y'all, this is. <sighs> and then they said, well, you know, you really shouldn't have. And I said, well, what about a dog? And I was like, you really shouldn't be having a dog right now either. And I was like, OK, look, you can't you can't do both to me. <laughs> you can't you can't. I've been really good this whole time. I've been I've been obedient since November. I I have been a really good girl. My labs have been all been great. I haven't had any problems. You cannot keep both things from me at this point. You can't tell me that I can't travel and tell me that I can't have a dog. So I I gotta have one. Which which one is it gonna be? So so they're like, yeah, you getting on a plane right now with the decompression, all that kind of stuff. You're not doing that you can have a dog, but you, you have to be sure that you don't let the dog lick you in the mouth. I'm like, I'm black. We don't, don't you know, we don't do that. Um, yes, I did actually say that to my dog. Um, 
And they said that I have to, you know, wear gloves and a mask uh, when I pick up his poopal dupes. And because this dog is so big, I'm just going to get a bunch of newspaper and put it on the ground <laughs> because I was approved to um, adopt uh, Sirius. And let me, oh, I should, I should find a picture of him. That would be good. Um, Sirius is a Rottweiler and um, what is he? He is a Rottweiler and Labrador mix. So he's got a big round forehead and he's got this pointy nose <laughs> and the rest of him looks like a Rottweiler. It's very interesting. Um, he is uh, a very good dog. He's a very good boy. He has been in the kennel for a pretty long time. Uh, and he's seven years old. And here is a picture of him. Finally, I finally found one. I only found it. There he is. And I'm going to, <clears throat> I'm going to go pick him up tomorrow. He is, like I said, he's seven years old and I intentionally, um, adopted an older dog this time because I have osteoarthritis in both knees. Um, so it's kind of difficult <laughs> to walk the way I need to walk, uh, to really deal with it, but he'll help because, you know, he will help get me outside for a walk a couple of times a day. And he's, he's old. So he's not like, he doesn't have that puppy energy that I have to, you know, run chase behind down the street He's a chill old man who just wants to enjoy his walks and sniff other dogs pee and, <laughs> and, and come back to the house and hopefully just have a snack and cuddle. Um, but that's, that's my little family update. So I won't be alone anymore. And that's, that's a nice thing. I, I don't think I have been lonely. That's kind of interesting. Um, I don't think I have been lonely since Abdus have, have, has gone um, and Bruski. I have been missing them. Like I have specifically been missing their presence. Like there is, like there's an Abdus shaped hole in my existence now. There's, there is an abdus shaped hole in this house. There's a brewski shaped hole too. There's, you know, a brewski shaped ex uh, uh, presence uh, or lack of a void of his presence in this house, you know, and the good feeling that, that, that I had when I was with my little family, when we were just together being a family eating dinner on the bed, which couldn't stop him from doing, but you know, okay. Um, with the dog or just, you know, cuddled up together, me and Ab just with the dog too, watching this. I miss those things, right? But I have not been lonely, partially because I've been so doggone busy. <laughs> um, and and my busyness has been intentional uh, to, to kind of help me cope with with all of this, um, dealing with that. And then the health issues right on the heels of that pretty much. So it's been interesting being in the house by myself with nothing, nobody in here to talk to. That has been very, I, it's been okay, but I haven't liked it because I'm not used to it. And it's, it's not my level of comfort. So being a dog mom, that, that has been my level of comfort, you know, so I get to have that back. Um, and it probably won't be for a long time because he is seven and he's a big breed and big breed dogs. Usually they have a shorter lifespan than smaller dogs. Big breed dogs usually develop big breed dog health problems like heart disease, um, osteoarthritis in their joints and, and sometimes hip dysplasia or spine problems, big dog. Um, I'm hoping I can, I can 
you know, pamper him to a couple more years than he would have had. But I'm just glad to be able to rescue a dog that had been in the kennel for a very long time and deserved to have his forever home and to be loved. And I get to have a companion um, here all the time who can keep me company. He's not going to keep me out of trouble. He will be my accomplice, just letting you know. And his name will no longer be serious. His name will be Kimothy Abdus Lukman. So that's my happy update for today, for this week. Glad you all stuck around for a little chit chat afterwards. I appreciate you so much. Uh, catch Darker Than Blue. <laughs> yes, I have to remember the name of my own show. Catch Darker Than Blue next Friday at 5 p.m. You can listen on WPFW uh, 89.3 FM. Uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. You can go to the website, WPFW89.3.org, or you can watch right here. You can watch right here on Black Power Media next Friday at 5 p.m. So you all have a great weekend. Be really, really good to each other. Be good to yourselves. And as always, a luta continua. The struggle continues, but I promise you, if you keep fighting, if we keep fighting, if we organize and keep fighting, Victoria Acerta, victory is certain. Peace, people. <laughs>